as it relates to outcomes. And in order to kind of get a sense of who you are, I want you to teach me, teach us this so that we can tailor things. We're going to just redo this. Okay. Um, who here has what you would say a beginner level of exposure to design thinking? Beginner. Okay. Who would say you're kind of intermediate? You have an intermediate exposure. Okay. And who would say you kind of have a high level expert? You do it every day. Okay, great. So very good swath. About, you know, I would say, you know, 40-40-20 uh, on those. Uh, so I think we're going to start with the... You got it now? Where's that? What's that? Try the other, um, the other plug so here. Nope. This one? Yeah. Okay. All right. We're iterating here. Technology. You got it? Yay. All right. All right. So, um, for those of you who uh, you know come from different design backgrounds, I just wanted to, I found this diagram once and I think it's really helpful to kind of level set because no matter what everybody's style is, this is kind of the general process that people go through. So on the left, we ideate, we prototype, we make those ideas tangible, take them out to the field, um, we get feedback, 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 and then the key that to me delineates design thinking as a discipline is iteration. And my own experience is I got injured in a yoga class a year ago and injured my back. I have a bulging disc and have been in a tremendous amount of pain for about a year. Um, tried to join the Women's March in January and I had to pull over in Sacramento because I could not walk. And I otherwise see myself as a very healthy um, person and energetic person. And I was very humbled by this. And as a medical student, uh, at 24, I remember thinking, what's the big deal? Why can't, what, what's the big deal with back pain? Like, why can't people just get up and just suck it up and do it, you know? And so I, my karma has come back to me, and I am now um, experiencing this design process on myself and iterating, iterating, iterating. But thank God that I found design thinking because I know better than to think of it as like a goal and to give up, Right. And, you know, in our, in our work at Engaged In, we deal with sort of neuroscience-based design. And there's an area in the brain called the habenula, which if you uh, set a goal and then you fail at that goal, the habenula is a failure counter in your brain, which then will downregulate your motivation to try that same thing again. And it's supposed to keep us from touching the stove over and over, and over again, like, ouch, ouch, ouch. But in... Setting goals of, of getting over illnesses, dealing with back pain, those kinds of things, it works against us because it disempowers and makes us stop and, and feel like we're failing. And so in everything that I've seen, patients who have the mindset, the growth mindset, as Carol Dweck calls it, um, of iteration, it gives them a way to keep going and it gives us a way as humans to keep going despite obstacles. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, Karen De Silva is to my right from Atrius Health, Dr. De Silva. Uh, she's been a patient advocate for primary care her entire career, and to this day is still an active um, patient uh, PCP. Um, she's also spent the last couple of years building various clinical care programs, but she's been most excited about her recent role at, at the Innovation Center because of the deep emphasis on understanding patient needs. To her right, Patricia Byrne. Byrne. Byrne, yeah, thank doesn't you. Doesn't matter. Um, creative lead for the Design <laughs> Innovation Group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, as well as a design educator focused on shaping the experiences of living and dying in the context of healthcare services. She's got service designers, design researchers, UI, UX, and a behavioral psychologist on her team. And they collaborate with institutional and outside partners to transform the experience and delivery of cancer care. To her right, one of her collaborators is Frank Lichardi. Yep. Lichardi. Uh, he's a founding member of uh, Sloan Kettering's Family and 
Patient and Family Advisory Council for Quality. He's a patient advisor, and his work is focused on providing, amplifying, and integrating the patient voice into all aspects of patient care. He currently leads a committee focused on optimizing the survivorship experience. Last but not least, Johan Sonnen. Is it Sonnen? Thank you. Um, he, we heard from him earlier. Uh, designer and apostle of open source healthcare, as he mentioned. He teaches design and engineering at MIT, leads a healthcare design firm, Goinbo, and where he works on uh, designing policy to pixels to proteins, so the whole spectrum, as well as HHS, Walgreens, startups, the whole gamut. Um, to date, they've served 150 million people uh, that they've designed for, so he says he screwed up a lot of lives. So with that, I'm gonna, I ask the panel to present, or to start with like a five minute uh, kind of Ignite talk on their work, which includes and is inspired by what's a story in your life of combining design thinking that specifically generated outcomes. So I'll start with Dr. Zusilva. And you can hear me? Just a little bit about Atria's Health. Um, we're in this greater Boston area. Uh, we have a few uh, interesting attributes, actually, including the fact that we've been on an electronic medical record since the late 1960s, 70s, initially homegrown. But in the mid-90s, we were in the first uh, Epic, one of the first Epic clients. So we have a ton of data. We have taken a lot of risk. About 50% of our patients are actually risk patients. So we have both clinical data and cost data, which was really allowed us to do a lot of population management. So we've, uh, for example, just found out this week that um, in Medicare's Pioneer ACO, we hit number one nationally in, in quality. So we've, mm -hmm. we've done a lot of that, that kind of work. Um, but what's interesting is that while 50% of our patients are fee-for-service and 50% of our patients are, are risk patients, we actually make about 75% of our gross revenue on risk. So we love the value-based world. We can play in that world. And because we're not actually part of a hospital system, which is also pretty unique, we actually don't have to feed the beast. And so we can really work really well with our patients about keeping them out of the hospital. That's a goal of ours. So in 2015, we launched an innovation center and pulled together a group of people that was very different from any group that I had ever worked with before. It was human factors engineers, manufacturing engineers, Six Sigma, um, you know, lean, um, uh, anthropologists, design thinkers, uh, ethnographers, uh, and clinicians. And the first thing we did was go out into, the, into the, our, our practice and we actually visited our patients in their homes soon after they had been in the hospital. And the things that patients say are just powerful. I mean, just really powerful. I'd rather die than go back. The other thing that we really, really heard very closely was that, you know, home is where they want to be. So hospital bad, home good. But as providers, we often blow by that in the sense that we are like, well, if you need a hospital, you need a hospital. But the intensity of the emotion that these people were expressing to us made us ask the question, how, how can we obsolete the hospital? And that was really where we went with our, with our work. How, how can we obsolete the hospital? We do a mix of design thinking and engineering in the, in the methodologies that we use. This is just an example. We've really tried to be very, very thoughtful about um, how are we going to think about this problem. So, you know, we think about a system. The system we were building was a hospital at home program. And what are the subsystems that we're going to need to build? So in a car, you're going to need headlights, you're going to need a chassis, you're going to need the electronics. They need to work very perfectly together. And then you, you actually have to get to the components and you have to put them all together back up the other way. And they have to all work together as well. Our work is extremely visual. And so we really try to keep it up on our walls. Our walls are changing constantly. And this is just an example of the systems that we were thinking, the subsystems that we were going to need to build out. So we needed to build out a mission control. We needed to build out, you know, uh, actually supply chain for acute care in the hospital, which is like an amazing story in and of itself. Um, but one of the things was the patient's home. And so we actually mocked up, uh, we called it Nani's living room, in the innovation center. And we had some uh, very kind and generous volunteers come in. And I don't know if you can really tell in that picture, but there's an IV pole there, there's some Bluetooth devices, there's an iPad that's a video visit to a provider, 
personal emergency response system. So there's a number of different gizmos. And we needed to make sure, because most of the patients that are going to benefit most from this program are, are elderly, that we weren't going to totally overwhelm them. You know, when you, when you, we call it medically harden the home, but, but when you're going to turn their home into a hospital, we don't want them freaking out. You know, and we also want the technology intuitive, so we needed to have them have a device where they could just pick up something or do something and have connection with mission control right away. And we used a number of different things. And we finally ended up using an old-fashioned land, it looks like an old-fashioned landline, because that was what they were comfortable with, you know. And so really kind of iterating around, does this, is this okay and is this intuitive and all that kind of stuff was really actually a very, a very important step in how, how we built it out. So a quick story, um, we, our patient number one uh, was a 92-year-old gentleman who was legally both blind and deaf. He had had four hospital stays in the previous eight months, all of them due to infections, usually urinary, and change in mental stat status, which is common with confusion and stuff in the elderly. And each time he went in for a week, the infection probably didn't need a week, but then he would go down into this very confused, bad world, and each time needed both chemical and physical restraints to keep him safe from falling. Um, and then each time he needed a one to two week stay in a skilled nursing facility because he had been sitting in a bed for a week and had lost all of his ADLs. So he came into one of our offices and it was the same story where his mental status had changed, he was confused, he had a urinary infection, and we admitted him to his home. Um, the next day, he was actually worse and a, a little bit more confused and looking short of breath. We actually did a chest x-ray in the home, had a report within a couple of hours. He now had a pneumonia and we adjusted his antibiotics. And by the following day, he, his, his sensorium had cleared, his delirium had cleared. Um, he was sitting on his back porch and um, actually did beautifully. It's a, it's a, we call it a 30-day episode of care. So the first few days is, is an acute level of service like you would get in a hospital. But then we have a restorative phase um, so that we know that he doesn't backslide. And it's a time where you really get to know the family and, and what their situation is. And it became extremely clear that this was an untenable living situation and he was going to end right back up to where he was before. And so actually part of the restorative phase was transitioning him out of his home and into an assisted living uh, facility. So this picture is our medically home team and this bouquet of flowers arrived at our mission control. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's balloons there and they're happy birthday balloons. And we were like, what the heck is this? And the daughter called and said that they, the, the kids had been trying to get him out of his house for years and had never been able to do it. And he had moved into this assisted living device and he was in place and he was a new man. He was socially engaged. He was medically so much safer. And so they added the balloons because they said, we feel like this is the first day of the rest of his life. So I just, it was a great, it was a really great story. So, all right. All right. All right. And Patricia and Frank, you're next. All right. You can come on up. Sarah asked me if I had worked with any patients that could come, and I was like, have I got one for you? So Frank <laughs> Lichardi is going to present with me. Um, so I'm the creative lead of the design innovation group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and um, we work very closely with our PFAC. I like to consider them my, like, collaborators as creative leads, that they have a, a sort of creative leadership role of their own in the work that we do. So we're going to describe some of that. But um, first to just introduce what design innovation does, especially when you think you can imagine being the designers at a cancer center. We're not the first people that you come to when you want to improve clinical outcomes. But we are the people that um, that the institution comes to to look at the patient experience and the clinician experience and using services, environments, and interfaces to both inform those experiences and also transform them. So we have, as we said, a psychologist on our team and different UX service designers. So we leverage behavioral insights, institutional strategy, cultural and technological trends, and also ethnographic research to identify and test opportunities for innovation. And the question that we really ask is how might we leverage the best practices in service and experience design to reach new frontiers in both clinical care and patient experience? So we're the post-it people. Um, and we often come down to these like intangible 
um, values in the institution, like nurses really care, and we have to figure out how to embody that in all of the experiences that patients and clinicians have and all of the relationships. So we have to drill into what it really means. And our group has existed for about eight years, and over that time we've interviewed and observed hundreds of patients and family members and their experiences, um, observed in clinics to really understand and unpack the experience. Um, but it's only over the last couple of years that we've been really invited to the table to talk about clinical outcomes and how we might transform experiences to enhance clinical outcomes. And that invitation coincides with the PFAC at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which I'll let Frank sort of Thank you, Patty. So um, uh, again, I'm Frank Lichardi and uh, one of the founding members of PFAC. We started PFAC at Sloan Kettering back in the first quarter of 2015. Uh, and I think uh, by way of backdrop, I think we've all seen over the last couple of decades sort of, a, sort of a new form of consumerism that we've seen really radically alter a number of different industries. And uh, eventually it made its way into healthcare. And so uh, it set the stage for something like PFAC to exist. Uh, we've seen it really take hold. In fact, here in Massachusetts, it's a requirement for any hospital to have a PFAC. Uh, you can read their reports on a monthly basis. They're publicly available. Uh, in any event, we spoke to some folks at Dana-Farber and some other cancer centers uh, to understand uh, how to optimally set up a PFAC. Um, uh, you know, I think that we, um, candidly, initially, we were a bit reticent in that we didn't want to be window dressing. We didn't just want to be a, a lovely little resource that they could point to and say, hey, look, we listen to our patients. Um, but uh, the reality is I've been, uh, I've been humbled and uh, amazingly impressed by the level uh, of our engagement. Uh, we've been engaged by people at the highest levels of the organization. Uh, we've been involved in real projects that have a real impact. Uh, we're, we're not just commenting on the color of signage. Uh, we're, we're modifying and changing and optimizing uh, how care is delivered, how cancer care is delivered. Uh, and we take that commitment really seriously. Um, so, you know, we, we uh, ha establish a rigorous process of interviewing potential candidates. You know, we establish our bylaws and, uh, again, by the end of Q1, uh, in May, in fact, actually, so I guess closer to Q2 of 2015, we launched. Um, and uh, um, uh, I, again, we've had a remarkable amount of, uh, of uh, interaction with the highest levels of the organization. Yeah. And even us, which is not the highest <laughs> level of the organization, but a, a unique and more fun part of the organization. So um, Frank had sort of coined for me the, the term the patient experience revolution. And so we often um, sort of come to the table because of this understanding um, of both the, from the patient side of growing expectations of tailored and coordinated service experiences. So if we can order groceries remotely and hail a cab in a way that is tailored to our own preferences, that I can think how ripe I want an avocado is important, but somehow wh what time I want my appointment to end when it was supposed to start three hours ago is no longer important or in my control. There's like a disconnect. So for, for patients, there's this expectation in every other part of their life that they can have services that are coordinated and personalized. And they're bringing, as has been mentioned a lot today, this consumer mindset to healthcare. They're looking for recommendations for doctors. More people are turning to Yelp than are turning to their primary care physician for references for new doctors. And on the institution side, there's an understanding that we need to grow word of mouth marketing, that just our, our outcomes is not enough, and a focus on improving outcomes and adherence needs to focus on the experience. Stress is correlated to negative clinical outcomes. Um, confusion is correlated to a lack of adherence. So the experience and how we can help people understand and cope with what's going on in their cancer care is increasingly important. And of course, value-based payments don't play the smallest role. So co-design is a great way to bring the needs of both of these parties together in new patient-centered service experiences. So there are two ways in which our group, the design innovation group, um, uses design 
thinking and design um, to improve outcomes. So I'm going to give you two quick examples. One is in designing what the real challenge for the institution is and unpacking it. And we were asked to come to the table to help ask the question of how might we apply a transdisciplinary lens to better understand the challenges of symptom management for high-risk patients. So patients who are undergoing chemotherapy who are at the highest risk for being admitted for an inpatient stay that could have been avoided if we had acted sooner. Happens all of the time. And so what we did is we went beyond the traditional chart review where doctors would get together and do a root cause analysis of looking at the charts and seeing what, what could have been done and what happened. But we combined this chart review with our ethnographic research of what was going on with patients when they were at home. And we created a narrative patient journey workshop where we went through the real story of what happened to actual patients when they were at home and how their symptoms progressed and how they interacted with our institution or didn't and why. And we had clinicians, including nurses and oncologists, UCC doctor, urgent care center doctors, um, as well as administrators and operations people, go in and try to recommend what we could have known or done that would have avoided this admission. And we had several different stories of actual patients. And by the end of the workshop, we were able to determine what we could have actually done that would have kept those patients at home, would have kept our beds free for people who, who needed them, who had unavoidable um, clinical progression. And we really engaged lots of different members of the clinical community in envisioning what we could do differently and how we could go from being a reactive model for symptom management to a proactive model. The other way in which our group um, is engaged in improving outcomes is by prototyping and envisioning new kinds of experience touch points, new types of objects, interfaces, environments, that um, create a meaningful change in care for our patient population. And re most recently, we, um, we hosted, we, we recruited four graduate design interns. The last two summers, we've worked closely with our PFAC to establish new ways in which design can help us understand parts of the patient and family experience. And last year, we did one on the family caregiver. And this year, we just finished one around the transition to survivorship and what survivorship means, how it's defined by different people. Clinicians define it differently than patients define it. And so we really drilled into what does it mean to be a cancer survivor, and what do we do to shape a meaningful transition, and then also longitudinal engagement with our survivor population. Because we have a growing patient population, which is great. We have a growing number of survivors because of our awesome care, which is even greater. However, our patients never want to leave. So it's a stress on our clinical resources in a way that doesn't actually offer as much clinical benefit to the um, survivor population as it does a sort of psychosocial connection to the community. So our interns work very closely with Frank to develop some touch points I'm going to introduce two and then let him reflect on them for a moment. But um, one of them was this um, transition to primary care, which we had found, and you can interrupt me if, there's any, if I'm missing anything. Um, but the institution recognized both because of the PFAC's work in this area and because of the clinical um, experience that there was a hesitation to transfer over to primary care for a variety of reasons. There is a distrust in primary care among our patient population because sometimes the primary care physician missed the cancer in the first place. Or there was a real feeling that when you go back into primary care, suddenly your, your provider is not going to have the expertise or know what you really just went through. It's pretty intense. So. So you just went through this intense curative experience, and then you're going to go back and be sort of in this well population. And that is kind of a daunting thing. So this transition to primary care has to be sort of introduced very early on and um, made more smooth. So we um, designed that new experience and how to introduce it in the clinical relationship. And then also new touch points on the portal for survivors that would allow them the opportunity 
to stay engaged with the institution by sort of logging their sort of symptoms and questions and problems and their own sort of clinical data in order to um, in order to stay engaged with our research and allow our researchers to better understand survivorship. Uh, just a, one quick thing I'll just speak to is just broadly this concept of transition. It's not only to your primary care physician, but it's broadly the transition process away from when you're being treated to when you're sort of back in part of gen pop, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we did our own ideating within our PFAC one very long evening. And what we were noticing amongst all of our other our peers is we all spoke, spoke to a very real uh, point in time during our, our time at Sloan Kettering, which was, uh, you know, in my case, my surgery was done, my chemo was done, my radiation was done. And at the start of all this, uh, I, was, I had a 1% probability of survival. And when it was all done, I remember walking out into the waiting room with my wife and she said, where are the balloons? Mm -hmm. uh, where's the acknowledgement of what you just did that you're alive? And mm -hmm. so I wasn't the only one who experienced that. And so we, in fact, we, with, um, uh, through Sloan Kettering, sent out a really broad survey to thousands of patients and invariably kept hearing back these very same anecdotes. So that's why we saw such a critical need to develop these prototypes. Great. Thank you, guys. What's going on there? Oh. Um, and we're going to switch decks here real quick. Uh, Johan? You're up. Okay, let's see if I can do this in two minutes. So we have time for Q&A. If you want to get a hold of me, feel free to uh, email me or tweet me here. Um, Okay, so we know that healthcare is fairly naughty, uh, also N-A-U-G-H-T. Um, the data stinks, uh, the actors are tough to get, especially as designers. We need to talk to the people who are in it. Um, it's one thing to see them afar, but you need to live it. Uh, there's a system bias on the money and certain clinical determinants. Uh, yeah, we know it's complicated, right? And you actually have people's lives in your hands. So the way that uh, we're talking about design here is more in the system. You have to go from the atomic units to the galactic. You need to see the whole thing, otherwise it's a point solution, right? So what has SPM been talking about for years? The patient is the atomic unit, right? But then you have to go up and figure out, well, what else do they touch, right? In the K-N-O-T-T -T way, right? Um, and then you have to sort of expand. There are other variables and other vectors to this, which you start at the data element level, because that's really what defines a human, all the way up to the personal services, right? So there are lots of different vectors here on how you have to think about it. And as a designer, as an engineer, you need to see the practice of medicine in the flesh, in the actual bathroom, wherever it happens, uh, or wherever it is, because you need to live it. Now, here's one of my spawn, I'm pretty sure he's my spawn, uh, at uh, Children's, uh, getting an MRI. That, you know, it's, it's wonderful you have the, if you have the experience to design something from the ground up, like an MRI machine, and the experience there, that's rare. There are other occurrences where a colleague uh, and I were, uh, Rob, were at the Operation uh, Center of the Future at the MGH, overlooking, you know, the... Uh, uh, procedures and uh, you have to experience it right and with the burned skin smell and the goiter popping you know Rob got a little sick but that's part of the uncomfortableness right don't worry it's hamburger helper right but <laughs> you have to also see it at home right where again this is also my second spawn um, you have that, that's where that's where things happen most because you're not with the doctor most of the time and that's a critical part of healthcare and health. Uh, so you have to see them washing them hands or not. Um, uh, and then you have to live it. So, so often we talk about virtual care. Yeah, how many people here have it on their phone or are using it? Right. And that to me is an indictment of us. If you're not using it, this is a real encounter, don't worry, my entire data is open source, licensed under CC0, my entire genome is open source, so go for it. Um, but this is a real encounter I had just a couple weeks ago with Sherpa. You have to live it. And so that's something, you know, if you're, if you're thinking telemedicine and virtual care here, you have to go to use it. Um, so I'll, 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 so let me get to the actual micro case study here. Um, 
let's look at uh, carrier reporting. The objective here was to design something beautiful, beautiful in terms of the experience of doing it, of seeing the reports, of dealing with the clinician. And uh, you know, after dealing with uh, genomics for the past decade, this, there's a reason why the reports look this good. <laughs> That's sarcasm. Uh, because the analysts and research scientists get the data back that looks just like this in their Excel spreadsheets. So it's like, oh, let's do a mirror. Everyone will love this. Yeah, that's horseshit, right? Um, and this is another one. This is all open. Like, you can go Google these uh, to your heart's content. Um, and this is pretty bad. This is, I mean, the fact that you're showing me the variance. Oh, my God. Um, and no normal human being, uh, uh, maybe I'm not normal, would want that. Um, but using, but actually talking to people. So we had a specific tenant to say, go out and talk to people, both the patients and their care teams, clinicians, genetic counselors, and the research scientists to gather what the hell is really happening and what they need. You have to do a design-driven approach. And so the key findings here uh, are probably are no surprise to many of you, but I'm going to go to a couple uh, uh, doozy. Most patients don't get the damn report. What the? You know, that's insanity. Uh, and this is the company that uh, uh, fu funded this and has, has continued to fund us, for better or for worse, for a couple years. Uh, this was news to them. They had no idea. And they're the second biggest or third or fourth, you figure it out, uh, genomics analysis firm on the planet. So you have to show them this kind of re research or they don't change their minds. So we've gone through the design practice here. This is an early design. It's not particularly great. But we had to show the data embedded in the design. That six clinicians said this, you know, and there was some uh, goodness here or badness here. Uh, and then Rev. So our recommendations were, guess what? Always deliver the damn results. One, uh, they have to be understandable by clinicians too because they're not trained in genomics, right? For the most part. Uh, and then deliver the results before the encounter. How's that? Right? Basic, basic things here. And then the, the last one, which is also pretty cool, is once you have the encounter with a, with a clinician, those notes go back into the report, like open notes like we heard about this morning. Common sense. But what I think is really good, or the pretend goodness here, is that the CEO and CMO of this company said, holy crap, I had never heard that before. So I had to like go, hmm, this is a company you want to work for again. But we kept going and said, yeah, this is what you should be doing. And they use this now across their services. So millions of people, as of you know, a couple months ago and in the future, will be getting the reports, the genomic testing reports, in advance of their clinicians or at the same time. Um, they will be then, the second part of this is this, they, they institute this as policy. Now we're working with them, and their new policy is, a new DUA, data use agreement, where patients own the data, right? So in this case, they're going to co-own it with this company, but it is on the first page in a single bullet point. You will own your data. Uh, and that's, that's pretty impressive. And when you do research and have numbers to back up your ethos, your thesis, and your desirements, that changes corporate minds. Uh, so this is sort of the, the uh, I don't know if this is exactly this route uh, or linear like this, but I think this is this, the, the way we're going towards patient data ownership. Uh, and that's my rant. Thanks. So one of the things that, you know, I find valuable if I go and take my precious time to go to a panel is to figure out how do I apply it back in my home environment? How do, I, how do I make progress when I leave here, right? Because everything that you learn, even though you have a spike of interest or inspiration or enlightenment, um, it needs to kind of ground somewhere, it needs to become applied in order for it to live on. Otherwise, you kind of forget about it and go, oh, that was cool. You know, so we were talking in our planning meeting about just how common it is uh, for people at this layer of the design thinking kind of, you know, spread to run up against challenges within organizations or within people who don't really understand what design thinking is. So if you're the kind of person who's trying to push for patient-centered uh, initiatives, um, participatory initiatives, design thinking initiatives, this is your question, all right? So panel, how do you deal with institutional barriers uh, or misunderstanding or even skepticism to design thinking as you start to 
you know, bring this very powerful method of participatory approach? I'll answer. Um, we, because we do a lot, and I'm sure all of us do, a lot of um, like ethnographic research, we do a lot of observations and interviews with patients and families and clinicians and everything. Um, we're able to, to, to use storytelling based on actual cases to sort of build out all of the perspectives of, of, a, of a problem so that, to make people in the institution look at it differently. I think that works really well for us. So in the, in the case of this symptom management at home where our chemo patients are going home but they're getting really sick when we can't see them, we're able to sort of tell the story not just in the way where nurses were saying we give them all the information, we tell them when they're supposed to call us. But then the patients were telling us that they didn't want to call because they didn't want to bother their doctor. And they were afraid to be marked as a trouble patient and that that would impact their care. Or they were afraid to say that they had symptoms because they were afraid then they would get a dose reduction of their chemotherapy and that would hurt their outcomes. And so there was a lot of misunderstanding on both sides. And by telling the story from the patient and family point of view and kind of reflecting it back to the clinicians, they're often much more able to engage in problem solving that's more patient-centered. But they usually, as, as we all do, we only see the story from our own point of view until we're able to capture the other side. Great. And Frank, what is the kind of patient side of that story in terms of just sharing the power of design thinking as you've applied it to your life or even your role as a leader in the organization? Sure. I think, um, you know, we have actually followed a lot of Patty's group's lead in the sense that um, uh, we're often invited to some of these off-sites. And uh, uh, I think there's some reticence initially about that time investment. But at the end of the day, if you really do want to push past some resistance, when people see firsthand those stories sort of come to life and you start with a, a wall littered with notes, but at the end of the day you have a really compelling narrative. And then to quickly come back and, and iterate something and prototype something, uh, even if it's a bunch of static HTML screens, uh, I've been surprised at the impact that's had on, on leaders. Mm -hmm. And Karen, maybe share some things that you've done with the Innovation Center that has kind of cut through any sort of organizational uptake yeah. issues. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is, in my previous roles as um, uh, Director of IM and WCMO, I had launched a bunch of programs, but I'd, I've never been given the richness of the period to kind of research and define the, the really what is the unmet need and what is the, the pain point. And it really does give you the opportunity to um, develop this patient voice. And so I do think it is the stories. Um, and then I think through the iteration phase, you actually start to be able to build the case because it's working and it's working better because you've been able to incorporate all of this into the, the work that you're doing. Yeah, I'm going to tweak it a little bit for you, Johan. Um, the, the question I have is, um, you know, you, you mentioned that there's this kind of, as design thinking kind of gets hot, red hot, people kind of go, oh, let's have a workshop or let's have, you know, and that's kind of the first pad at trying to get it included into the organization. What is your experience about that? Maybe you should make some comments about, you know, we talked about dose effect of design thinking. What takes, what doesn't take? Uh, well, well, there is this aura that design will solve all. And that has been a, a luxurious part of being a designer uh, over the past few years because we've been uh, ignored and trampled on and the red the stepchild for, you know, uh, 45 years in software, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me still drives me that I'm, I'm still the underdog. Um, but uh, there's, a, been a, there's a difference between facilitation and actually doing design, the skill of design, and you have to be careful because those don't necessarily collide nicely. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it should go beyond a workshop, hopefully, right? Uh, to dragging executives, to dragging the analysts into the field. That to me is a huge moment changer. So we've done that for um, working on a food stamp program for uh, a state. Um, and when, you, when some of the people who work the program have never gone and seen what it is to deliver like the assessment and the motivational interviewing mm -hmm. and seen people who are you know, asking for food, your food stamps, that's a mind-altering experience for them. Absolutely. And just one or two of them in the organization can change it. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. All right, so I'm going to challenge us. So this is participatory medicine. 
We are now going to co-create the rest of this time together. So if it sucks, it's your fault. Um, I want you to take two minutes, and I'll put it on the clock to uh, give you. I want you to get a pad, your phone, whatever it is, to, to like brainstorm your own best question. Ready? Begin. Two minutes. What question do you have? For the panel? Yes, for the panel. Thank you. Remember, four year old curious kid. Are some of you doing it in your head? All right, so now I want you to turn to the person next to you and share your question and have them share their question and make a better question out of the two of you. Go. Okay, when do robots take over our jobs? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Yesterday, I mean. <laughs> Sooner than you think. Yeah. I so you're merging yeah. or improving your questions. For end research. of work. The well, end of work. For research, I think that will always be here because there's a human weird, we're weird. Right, but I think the pixel pushing and the code and that—oh yeah, shit, oh yeah, that'll be uh, that needs to go away and is going away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, fifteen I seconds. I hired a bunch of MIT developers years ago. That's right. Morgan. No, no, no. They were amazing <laughs> and they taught me so much about how to manage people because they're so eccentric. Five seconds. Doubt four, three, two, <laughs> one, and be quiet. I can absolutely see that. And be quiet. All right. All hands up here or eyes up here. I'm not a really good kindergarten teacher. All right. So who feels like you heard an amazing question from somebody else? All right. And who wants to point out that person? All right. So if you're pointed at right now, will you be so kind as to come up to the microphone? That's, this is good. This and is give the panel that your question. Yeah. So we're all co-designing it improv style here. Improv style. <laughs> it is very funny. All right. Go for it. Wait, we need uh, Adam. We need a mic, hot mic in the center of the room. I'm only four. I can talk really loud. Yeah, do it. Okay. Go for it. Well, I was going to say, I hope you're supposed to be a four-year-old asking this question. You're live. And this is directed to you, Han. How many crayons do I need to make a good design? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. It's uh, a great you question, with, you guys. You could do it with one. Okay. There you go. How many do you have? All right. Let, let's give her applause for her question, please. Good job. All right. We're hot. We're hot. So um, each of you has a job where an organization has hired you to um, do this kind of design and innovation. So my question is, why did they create that unit? I know this is going to sound a little cynical. Why did they create the unit? Why did, do they truly want you to innovate? How is that innovation tied to making money? Got it. Do you have to come up with an innovation that will also help them make money? Great. Excellent question. Yes. Go for it, guys. Well, I, I will tell you that um, I think that why a lot of medical centers across the entire country are launching innovation centers is that everyone is freaking out because of the pace of change and they don't know how to stay ahead of it. 
Um, I will also tell you that when we launched our innovation center, we actually did standard um, uh, questions across the country at the biggest innovation centers that you might expect and asked them, you know, what's your mission and how are you staffed and blah, 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 and was really struck by the fact of how many innovation centers said we're there because we're supposed to create a different revenue stream. And a lot of it was creating kind of commercializable, you know, patents, IP, all this kind of stuff, um, which is disturbing to me. And I'm, I'm happy to say that um, ours is really kind of focused on trying disrupting uh, the way care is being delivered. But I, I think that that's not a cynical question. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's a challenge that's out there in the healthcare world. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Can you give her a hand for a question, please? All right, next one. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I work with the Johns Hopkins Medicine Technology Innovation Center. And um, my question is really around the sort of the patient and family advisory committees. Um, we work with them too, and they tend to be the most engaged patients. And it's really hard for me to find the outliers that um, are the, the less engaged patients. So, how do you guys find ways to get you know patients that maybe ne wouldn't necessarily join those committees mm -hmm. from the start involved in what you're designing? Um, well, you know, it's funny. We're actually, um, I'm in the middle of an initiative currently uh, that we're call internally calling the PFAC Roadshow. So basically, myself or another member are going to different parts of the organization, speaking to them about our origin story, who we are, what we do. And ultimately, we think that that word of mouth within each department, uh, we're training them to identify the type of patients who might engage and help us uh, and, and have them identify some of those very patients. So, uh, you know, I also speak at new employee orientations and, you know, all, all these little touch points we have throughout the organization, our goal is obviously to hope to kind of saturate the organization with people who are champions for PFAC and ultimately finding potentially engaged patients. And I'm just going to piggyback a little bit. And in, in our work, we work very closely with the PFAC and we usually use the PFAC members as like our co-creative leadership. But we do have to make a real clear distinction that the um, sort of feedback of the PFAC members should not be taken as like representative of the full patient body. So we still do much like deep dive ethnographic research across a much more um, diverse sample of patients who might be having an experience that would not sort of make them you know, sort of self-selecting volunteer to be on PFAC, perhaps, and those are the ones that we really want to improve, um, you know, things for. So we have to balance the kind of leadership role of PFAC with some other representative samples of experience. But that's a, it's like a, a weird tension that we found, recently kind of found, and we had to distinguish who to talk to and who to listen to at each point. All right, question number three, yay, good job. All right, last question. Hi, I'm Grace Cordovano, private cancer patient advocate, and I loved all of your different perspectives. It seems that the common theme for a lot of different discussions today was that turning to patients and listening to patient and care partners' stories is very enlightening and insightful. So are we compensating patients for their expert insights and time? We, we are not. Uh, no. <laughs> this is but the issue, right? Oh, we do as part of you I mean the, just the interview process. Uh, of course, we have to pay them for their time. Uh, I think that's uh, actually. I think it's weird if you don't. So, could we come up with a design model to include patients being compensated for their insights because their values are yeah. liquid gold? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and they're also disproportionately burdened financially, time-wise, yeah. all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So. This is definitely the edge of just yeah. designing that. that that's yeah, a yeah. meta design. There are there are some instances in which we've like been able to op, like give CVS gift cards and things like that, which might okay. seem okay. it's it doesn't seem like enough, but but we do try to do incentivize you know the time, but we we don't we're not always able to. I love pushing yeah. the edge. So thank you for your question. Good job. All right, and to finish this off, I want you to grab somebody next to you and just you thank them for the work they're doing in participatory medicine and they'll thank you or they'll thank somebody else. Ready? Go. Well, thank you for the Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, I love you. I love you. Like I said, I All right. And thank you, my panel. Thank you guys for participating. Good job.